Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the first in-person only Miami Project talk um, since COVID, which has, it's been nice to see some familiar faces in the audience today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Barbara Marin. I'm a third year PhD student in the neuroscience program as part of Dr. Courtney DeMont's lab. And Dr. Courtney DeMont specializes in biomedical engineering. And you're probably wondering what's a neuroscientist doing in a biomedical engineering lab. And I'll tell you that I'm learning a lot. At least in the last three years, I've been learning a whole lot, and I'm really excited to be presenting today how we can harness the neural stem cell secretome for spinal cord injury. To begin with a little bit of background, we can talk about the incidence of spinal cord injury and the amount of people that are currently living with spinal cord injuries. And approximately there are 54 cases per 1 million in the United States, which means that it's an average of about 17,000 people annually. And in terms of the prevalence, we have over 294,000 people that currently live with spinal cord injuries in the United States. And the way that this is classified is based on the neurological level and the extent of the lesion. So for those of you who are not familiar with the characterizations of the spinal cord injury, we have two different types where we characterize with paraplegia and tetraplegia. Paraplegia is characterized by uh, the level of the injury where it affects the two limbs below the level of the injury. And tetraplegia is characterized by affecting four of your limbs. So tetra relating to four, four of your limbs are affected. And since 2015, the highest number of incidents for it is incomplete tetraplegia. And when you have an in incomplete versus a complete injury, that's characterized based on the motor and sensory deficits that are observed in the person who has a spinal cord injury. So you can have complete motor function loss, complete sensory function loss, and that's more of a complete injury. Whereas if you have incomplete, you might have some motor deficits, but not sensory deficits, or those vary. And some of the primary injuries of SCI are caused by vehicle accidents, such as motorcycle accidents, falls, for example, in older communities, if you fall, you can crack your bones, violence, such as gunshot wounds, and sports, such as sports injuries, such as football injuries, and things like that, that we also see in traumatic brain injury. And now the types of spinal cord injury that we can look at and we can look at in the clinic and as well as in, in pretty clinical studies are contusion injuries, which is when you have a compression of the spinal cord and it's not fully cut. Whereas when you have a transection, you can see in the circle here that you have a fully transected spinal cord. And that can be due to, for example, if you get a gunshot wound and it goes through and penetrates um, your spinal cord. Now, the primary injury, as I mentioned, uh, results in loss of neurons and glia, as well as injury to the vasculature that supplies the tissue. Now, following this primary injury, you have an infiltration of immune cells, cells that are resident in the spinal cord, such as your uh, astrocytes and fibroblasts that create this fibrotic and glial scar that prevents axon elongation. And the infiltrated immune cells release pro-inflammatory factors that create this heightened inflammatory state in the spinal cord, which makes it really difficult for treatment as well as mediating that response. And so my laboratory and my project, we're interested in how we can decrease that immune response and decrease inflammation at the site of injury for better uh, responses after injury. And when we look at the clinic and preclinical approaches for spinal cord injury, when we look at the clinical interventions, at the site of injury and in the emergency room, one of the main focuses for it is immobilizing the patient and improving the respiration. Now, when they get into the surgical area, they focus on surgeries as well as delivery of steroid medications to help with that inflammatory response and alleviate the tension that happens at the cord. And in terms of the post-op care that we can do, people have physical and occupational therapy that they have access to, assisted devices such as wheelchairs and other types of physical therapy help assistance, and functional electrical stimulation that has also been shown to assist. But however, there is no known cure for spinal cord injury. And so what are we working on in the clinic and what are institutions like the MAMI Project looking into? So when we look at preclinical research, there's areas of looking at sparring, repair, regeneration, and plasticity. And one of the ways that I'm interested in looking at that is using neurostem cells. 
Now, some of the benefits that have been associated with neural stem cells include promotion of tissue repair, integration with the intact circuitry following injury. They've been really attributed with secreting proregenerative factors, as well as modulation of the immune system. And I'm particularly particularly interested in looking at the, how these proregenerative factors ameliorate that immune response. Now, there are some challenges with stem cell administration. There's been a lot of clinical trials that have failed um, due to certain uh, reasons, some of them low transplant survival rates, one of them because of this large immune response that I've been talking about that happens during the secondary injury phase. But this graph breaks down the several problems that we encounter that decrease the survival of the transplants, starting with your expansion and disassociation. When you have a stem cell population, there's a lot of problems when it comes to rigor and reproducibility of where you get the origin of the stem cell types, how you culture them, and how you can get them, especially the cell lines, into the clinic. And then figuring out that you were able to fix this problem of standardizing the stem cell types that you're going to use to deliver for the spinal cord injury, then you have a problem with the injection forces that occur when you're delivering the cells. So the shear forces affect the cells, therefore also decreasing their transplant survival. And then once they're actually at the site of injury, you not only have your narrow stem cells that are present, but you have these other players that are there, such as your immune cells that are secreting these pro-inflammatory factors that target your cells and then remove them. So one of them is cell-mediated removal. That's another problem. So you have, uh, for example, a transplant that's not synergic, right? So you have something that's going in your body that is foreign. What is your body going to do? Be like, I don't know what this is. Let me take it out. So you furtherly um, decrease your transplant survival rates. Absolutely. Thank you. And so what are some ways that we can go to bypass these challenges with stem cell administration? And one of those is through the use of biomaterials, because they've been shown that they can remediate the injured spinal cord. And now there are some components of tissue engineering, and this is when the BME comes in that I've been learning. Um, some of these components include uh, cells, regulatory signals, biomaterials, and scaffolds. And so one of the ways that I'm interested in looking at that is through the use of encapsulation techniques, as well as hydrogel formation. And some parts of my project are also incorporating some regulatory signals, such as nanoparticles. And some of the benefits in spinal cord injury that have been shown with biomaterials is that they can limit scar formation and inflammation. They can provide substrate, substrates for these cells to attach and actually infiltrate, and they can provide cell protection for transplantation. And the ways that we can do this is that we can tune the biomaterials to get the promoted uh, desired response that you want. So for example, you can include pores, changing the pore size, density, as well as the interconnectivity of your biomaterial. So for example, if you have a hydrogel based on the way that you can cross-link it, you can have different pore sizes that allow for vascularization into the hydrogel and things like that. And you can also mess with the mechanical properties of your biomaterial. When you have different uh, different biomaterials with different mechanical properties, you want to make sure that the biomaterial that you're putting into your site is able to match the mechanical properties of your tissue. So you don't wanna put something that's too stiff in a spinal cord because then that would be difficult for it to have proper support. And then you want to address degradation rates. So for example, you wanna put something that's in the body that is foreign, that won't be rejected, but you don't want it to stay in your body forever. Right, that's something foreign. You can have tumor genicity and other um, adverse effects. So you want to tune the degradation rates to have your biomaterial be successful for as long as you need it to, but for it to also start to degrade so that you can have the beneficial effects without the adverse ones. And you can include bioactive factors, like I've mentioned, um, with nanoparticles. And that's a field that's developing, especially for trying to mediate inflammation. And so our lab has demonstrated that acute implantation of aligned hydrogel tubes supports delayed spinal progenitor implantation. And the way that they did this was that they did a hemisection 
of the spinal cord and implanted these hydrogel tubes. And the, these tubes are made of polyethylene glycol, which is an FDA approved biomaterial and that you can find in a lot of your local products at home in like your shampoos. If you look at the back of it, it'll say PEG. And that's an FDA approved uh, material that we are using in our lab. And we've been able to demonstrate that when you transplant these cells, you're able to get higher survival rates. They went in at two weeks after the transplantation of the tubes and compared the cells alone and the cells with the tubes. And as you can see, not only do we get significant increased survival, but you can also visualize the cells. And one of the good things about using a biomaterial is that when you go back into your tissue to look for it, it's more easy to see than the dispersal if you just inject the cells and hope that they stay there. And another biomaterial approach that is the technique that I will be utilizing for my project is conformal coding. And in the diabetes uh, field, conformal coding of stem cell derived islets has been used as B cell replacement. And the model works where you have your naked um, islets compared to the conformally coded islets. And as you can see, it doesn't really affect the cell structure. And they further demonstrated that it doesn't affect their viability. And when tested in the comparison with their function, it doesn't affect their ability to, for example, deal with glucose. And in vivo, they've also been able to retrieve the transplants when they're coded, which is another beneficial aspect that we have when we want to go back into the tissue and retrieve to see what these cells are doing. To talk about a little bit the differences of why not use previous encapsulation techniques and why use conformal coding. Traditional encapsulation techniques emphasize capsule diameter. So when you pass your cells through the encapsulation devices, you get these same size capsules, as you can see here. So di the diameters of your capsules are the same, but as you can see, there's really large diffusion distances between your cell can you guys see that? Oh yeah, perfect, okay. You see a lot of diffusion distance. And so there's a large diffusion barrier that affects the viability of your cells. Like Dr. Dietrich mentioned, they don't have a lot of access to oxygen or nutrients. So the larger the distances that these molecules have to travel greatly impacts the viability of your cells. And when you're looking at transplants specifically, what I'm particularly interested in looking at spinal cord injury transplants, it's a really small, area that you can transplant into. So having these large diameter capsules increase our transplant volume. And so we wanna decrease that. And once they're transplanted, how do we make sure that they're not gonna be free floating? How do we make sure that they cross link and stay at the site? And now also, as I mentioned, having these large diffusion distances also delays the secretion of factors. So if your cell is trying to release the waste products that they produce, they have a larger diffusion distances to get out. Or if there's beneficiary factors that they need to survive, they have a harder time of getting to them. And now the beneficial aspects of having conformal coding is that the distances between your cell and the outside of the capsule is significantly reduced. So when we pass the cells through the microfluidic system, it conforms to the size of your cell. So these capsules actually emphasize capsule thickness rather than diameter. So you can have a cell that's 50 microns in length and your capsule will be about what, 55 microns in length. And that greatly reduces the diffusion barrier that's there. It actually helps a lot with minimizing the implant volume that we need for transplants. And we can use it for more transplant applications because you don't need large areas um, to be able to transplant your cells. So if you have, for example, a smaller area to transplant, such as a spinal cord, you're able to use this application. And another thing that we're interested in is being able to control the pore size to mediate the secretion of factors. So one of the beneficiary aspects of this technique is that it's an immunoisolating technique, which helps us to prevent antibodies as and other um, presenting antigens to label our cells. So if we're transplanting something that is external, our immune cells won't target it and then remove it from the, from the site. And so here's just a side-by-side -side comparison of the traditional encapsulation. As you can see, the size of the diffusion distances are significantly different. They both are able to mediate the immunoisolating component, but we have increased, um, increased viability 
because of this decrease in the diffusion distances. What I'm really interested in is being able to decrease the implant volume, which means that I can use more cells that are compacted in these capsules to deliver them into the spinal cord injury. And one of my overarching goals is, as I mentioned, neurostem cell survival is greatly affected with all of those different factors. And so my goal is to develop a thin coating biomaterial platform for neurostem cell delivery that can improve the neurostem cell survival to levels that are comparable to immunosuppressed um, rodents. So we don't want to inject them into animals that are immunosuppressed because that's not what we really see um, in the clinic. And it'd be better to be um, it'd be better to assist people who are not immunosuppressed so that they can have a more of a fighting chance. The coding material has been shown for, I think, up to a year of, yeah, the degradation on it is really slow um, based on the cross-linking agents that are used to form the capsules. So they last a really long time. Well, we haven't tested that, at least with the neural stem cells. With the uh, pancreatic islets, they are able to integrate into the host tissue. But I don't know the extent of that in vivo um, component with the diabetes research field. But I, I do know that it goes into the graft. And so my overall... Yeah, that's uh, our collaborator, um, Dr. Alice Tomei in the DRI. That's the, her technology that we are implementing here for our neural stem cells. Um, and so my overarching hypothesis is that transplantation of neural stem cells in conformal coatings will prolong their survival in spinal cord injury sites to maximize their pro-regenerative actions. And the ways that I want to go about doing this is that I want to establish first the neurostem cell encapsulation efficacy of about 70% by conformal coding. Because we haven't tested this encapsulation technique in our neurostem cell type, this is where a lot of the troubleshooting and making sure that the material doesn't affect negatively our cell types. And so for, for my first experimental design, in terms of culturing and collection of the neural stem cells, we have EGFP mice that we set up time pregnancies for. And at uh, gestation day 14, we isolate the spinal cords from these embryos and disassociate the spinal cord into um, neural stem cells. And then we expand them into neural spheres. And for the conformal coding aspect of the project, we take a 10 kilodalton eight arm peg, 75% functionalized malamide, and we cross link that with a two kilodalton peg dithiol. And so the way that this works is that the peg mouse and the thiol groups cross link together, forming a network. And then we take our neurospheres, combine them with the polymer that we just made, and we run it through a microfluidic system that puts in the cells and has a final um, cross-linking emulsion with DTT, and that's what forms our capsule. In terms of the flow, this is the setup that we use for encapsulating the cells. So the cells come in through this catheter, you have the PPG running through here, and the DTT, which is the emulsion that comes into here. And then we collect the cells right here. And so this is a close-up image of what the chambers actually look like. And so you have the cells coming in through your catheter and they're coming down as single neurosphere suspensions. And for a more uh, precise uh, diagram of it, you have the cells coming in through here. You have the oil that comes into the capillary and your cells with the sheer force that is coming through with the different flow rates uh, fully emulsify and make your capsules and they're collected in here. And so some of our preliminary results for this project are to demonstrate that we are able to conformally coat these neural stem cells. In the left-hand side, you see uh, naked neural stem cells that have been cultured and expanded. And on the right-hand side, we see conformally coated neurospheres. And as you can see here, 
similar to the diagram that I showed before with the conformal coding diagram, we're able to see a really small uh, distance of diffusion between your cell and the outer cap. Right now, we're about 70% um, encapsulation efficiency. And furthermore, we wanted to show that the polyethylene glycol um, material actually completely covers our cell. And so we did some histological staining um, provided by some of our collaborators. Um, Grizel Gonzalez took these beautiful confocal images. Um, and so what you can see on the left-hand side is the population of the cells. The ones that don't have the blue staining for the host um, are empty capsules. So you just see them in red. The beneficial aspect of using our cells that are EGFP means that they're already green, so we can identify them and we save, you know, staining on that. Um, and then the peg is the red. So as you can see, we have the blue and the green, and then we have the red, which is the peg covering the capsules. And in a more zoomed in image, we see that colocalization here. And so it was really exciting for us to be able to demonstrate some initial work that we are able to conformally coat these cells and that the coatings are fully covering the, the narrow stem cells. And then we wanted to look into how does this affect the cell viability? And so on the top hand panel, we have your host staining, the GFP, which shows us our live cells. And now the red is the ethidium um, homodimer. So it's no longer the peg that we're staining for, we're staining for dead cells. Um, and in the composite image, you can see qualitatively that there are more live cells than dead cells. Um, the face contrast images down here are just to demonstrate the cells that we are looking at up here. And this is a more um, uh, zoomed in image of what that population was. And so we're able to demonstrate that their viability is not affected being coded. And now something that I was interested in looking at is do these cells rupture out of the capsules? When we look at the islets um, that are used, um, those don't expand. And so they stay very happy inside of their capsules, but our neural stem cells proliferate. So I wanted to know, well, if I put them in these capsules, are they gonna burst out? And unfortunately they do. Um, and so I wanted to then further look into, okay, what media conditions do they need to be in or what media conditions affect their rupture rates? And so I did a, a small experiment where I looked at cells that were intactly inside of the capsules. And then the next panel, you will see what I characterized as a rupture neural stem cell. So here is the capsule and this neural stem cell is fully out of the capsule. And then in this one, it's starting to protrude out. And so I characterize that as well as a rupture. And the way that I conducted this experiment was that I incubated the neural stem cells in different media conditions. The neither condition doesn't contain growth factors, whereas the both condition contains both of the growth factors that we give them to maintain their phenotype and their viability. And the LIF condition and the BFGF condition are just supplemented with LIF and the BFGF only supplemented with BFGF. And what I was able to, to see is that the cells that are in the neither condition significantly stay less bursting. So they don't rupture as fast as the ones that are in the both condition or in the LIF and the BFGF condition. And something that I'm excited about from these results is that the fact that they're in the neither condition and they're not bursting out of the capsules is similar to the availability of growth factors that they're going to have when they're in the spinal cord. Because in the spinal cord, after an injury, they're not going to be supplemented with these growth factors that are going to make them happy. So the fact that they're not rupturing in that condition is a good thing for us. Um, but further um, experiments are going to look at whether we can attenuate this rupture rate with other um, biomaterial approaches. And something that my committee suggested was to also look at if rupture is affected in, in an inflammatory response. So I'm going to be modulating an inflammatory environment in vitro by taking a spinal cord homogenate and incubating these cells um, that are coated and uncoated with it. And then I'm going to perform the rupture rate experiment again to track their rupture and see if there's any significance um, based whether they're in an inflammatory response or environment or not, and how that affects the rupture and how we can mediate that as well. 
And then another aspect of the project that I wanted to get more clarification on was whether I could extract RNA and gain some insight into what these cells are doing. So I performed an RNA extraction on these conformally coded neural stem cells. I coded the cells as with our normal protocol. I got both of them, both conditions, the ones that were coded and uncoded. And I did RNA extraction, hoping that I would get something out of it and have um, quantified their RNA um, using a nanodrop. And thankfully, we didn't see any significant differences between the RNA content from the ones that aren't encapsulated to the ones that are. And this is important for us to have because we don't want the peg to affect our ability to extract RNA. And so that was really exciting to see that I can, one, extract RNA from these capsules, and two, that it's not significantly different between our naked neural stem cells. Yeah, so one of the reasons I want to extract RNA is because I want to see um, not only histologically that the phenotype of these neural stem cells isn't affected, but I also want to run a PCR on them to make sure that their phenotype isn't changed inside of the biomaterial. So I wanted to first get a step in, can I even get the RNA to perform those um, following steps? And another thing that I wanted to look at was to really say that capsule permeability is limited at the 150 kilodalton size. And so I performed a small experiment. It's a small diffusion um, assay. And in the left-hand side, this is the characterization for what I wanted to see as non-permeable. So I use uh, polystyrene beads as a uh, model for my neural stem cells. And conformally coded them just as I've done before. And the capsule, if it stays in black, symbolizes that there was impermeability of the FITC molecules that we incubated them with. And on the right-hand side, if they're green, then it means that the capsule was permeable. And so I tested this with different molecular weights of FITC dextrins and antibodies to demonstrate whether they were able to diffuse into the capsules or not. And for the first panel, we just did a PBS. These are confocal images, and these are just phase contrast images to demonstrate that what we're looking at is the capsules and the polystyrene beads in the capsules. So in the PBS condition, we don't see any FITSI because there was no uh, green fluorescence. But when we look at FITSI dextrin at the 10 kilodalton size, it's quite small, right? So we, we expected that to be able to diffuse in and out of the capsules just fine. FITC, when we look at FITC dextrin at the 70 k at the 70 kilodalton size, we also see uh, diffusion. This is actually a really nice picture of what my model was supposed to be. So you can see the bead, and then you see the capsule being penetrated. And then when we actually look for the IgG, which is the 150 size, we don't see any diffusion into the capsules, which is something that I wanted to make sure that was happening so that when I moved forward with my stem cells, I knew that they would be protected from these um, antibodies. Yeah, so the green is a FITC IgG, and so the capsules are incubated in a little um, gasket with that solution, and then you put your capsules that are with the beads, and so that's what you see. So the, the fact that you see the black, it means that there wasn't any diffusion into your capsules. And so that's what I was looking for. And this preliminary um, result demonstrate that we didn't get diffusion of that size into the capsules. Yes. So the capsule is made to protect against its antibodies, but against small inflammatory proteins as well. Uh, I guess, seven kilodalton. Right. And that's something that we're working on um, with one of the side projects that we're developing to be able to maybe sequester um, those small um, inflammatory cytokines that it will get in. And then I can get into that a little bit later. And in terms of the 
my AIM-1 summary and future directions, what I've been able to demonstrate thus far is that the conformally coded neural stem cells burst significantly faster over a two-week time period when cultured in media that has both of the growth factors compared to the other media conditions. I was able to establish that I can extract RNA from these conformally coded neural stem cells, and uh, we could limit capsule permeability to the 150 kilodalton size. And in terms of the future directions where this aim is going right now is that we're tuning the biomaterial to limit rupture. Some of the things that we're looking at is maybe double encapsulation. Um, and then I want to determine fully the neural stem cell viability inside of the capsules, and as well as looking at the impact um, of these conformally coded um, biomaterials on their phenotype, which is why we needed the first step with the RNA extraction. And so for the second aim of my project, after I establish the efficacy of conformally coding these neural stem cells, I want to look at how they're able to um, immunomodulate these bone marrow derived macrophages. So I'm going to be setting up a co-culture experiment with the neural stem cells and pro-inflammatory macrophages and looking to see how one, how the material protects the cells, but also looking into if these cells are able to modulate them towards more of an anti-inflammatory phenotype or decrease the amount of pro-inflammatory cytokines that are present. And so stem cells have been implicated in being able to have immunomodulatory properties. In spinal cord injury, they've been shown to increase um, IL-4 and decrease TNF and IL-1 beta, um, but these have just been implicated on the whole system level. They haven't been directly transplanted and been like the neural stem cells are secreting this and it's causing this. Um, so we are interested in seeing if we can increase their survival rates, can we then further go into mechanistically try to figure out what these cells are actually doing at the transplant site. And they've also been implicated in secreting an array of factors that also help with immune modulation and being pro-regenerative. And so my question is, how do these neural stem cell proteins, um, secreted proteins, modulate the immune response? And the way that I want to be able to do this is setting up the cold culture that I mentioned. So I'm going to be harvesting uh, murin bone marrow and having um, the macrophages. Then I'm going to stimulate them from se for seven days with MCSF treat them with LPS to piss them off, basically, make them really angry and, and inflammatory. And then after an hour, I'm going to be treating them with both naked neural stem cells and conformally coded neural stem cells and collecting the media as well as performing RNA extractions to see what happens in terms of their phenotype and the products that are expressed at the sites. And this is an in vitro experiment that I'm hoping would simulate some of what we will be seeing in vivo if I get to that point. And so some of the expected outcomes of this aim is that I want to be able to demonstrate that the neural stem cells modulate these bone marrow derived macrophages towards an anti-inflammatory phenotype, that the conformal coding system protects the neural stem cells from the bone marrow derived macrophages and the inflammatory environment, as well as to be able to see if these neural stem cell proteins can actually decrease uh, the pro-inflammatory cytokines that are present. And then my final aim, which I hope to get to, is to evaluate conformal coded neural stem cell survival following spinal cord injury. And the way that I want to do this is to determine the role of these neural stem cells uh, following SCI. And the timeline for my experiments are to perform, where is the pointer? Um, is to perform a C5 lateral hemisection and transplant the cells. Um, and now you might be wondering why a hemisection compared to a contusion or a full transaction, right? Um, our laboratory uses a hemisection model, um, as you saw in the previous paper I presented before, um, to demonstrate that when you inject a biomaterial there, there's an actual cavity for us to inject something to. And so if we inject it there, you still have the microenvironment that is formed after spinal cord injury, but you're actually able to implant something and then retract it out. And it also serves as the other side as a control for us when we look at the histology. And so I'm going to be doing at week zero uh, a hemisection, and then at week uh, two I'm going to tissue and capsule extract, and the purple line denotes that I will be doing that at week four and at week eight. And for the first cohort of animals, I want to look at capsule structure and impact on cell phenotypes. So some of the things that I want to look at is, do we see engraftment? How are the macrophages or the immune cells present affected? 
Um, I want to look at the histology for that. I want to use a streptavidin uh, biotin marker to be able to um, stain for the capsules. And I also want to see the effects that it has on the neural stem cell phenotype in vivo, as well as the macrophages that are in the area. And for the second cohort of animals, I will be performing the same um, experimental uh, spinal cord injury model, but I want to be looking at the evaluation of how these secreted factors modulate inflammation. So I'm going to be doing a gene and protein analysis, looking at pro and anti-inflammatory markers, as well as apoptotic markers, um, and doing a, an, an array of um, cytokine arrays to see how those uh, factors are present and modulated at the site of injury. And so for my expected outcomes from this aim, I want to be able to conformally uh, coat the transplants and that they will be protected um, from the immune response and that these factors that are being secreted by the neural stem cells mediate the immune response following spinal cord injury. And as most importantly for the basis of, of my project is to increase survival um, and engraftment with these transplants. Um, and also to demonstrate that the conformal coded system allows for injection into the spinal cord injury, um, filling the cavity. And in terms of some future directions that I'm interested in is to, I've been working on a side project of an injectable hydrogel. So I'm willing, I'm looking into maybe synergizing that delivery uh, using the injectable gel. Um, that way I can cross link further the, the capsules at the site of injury and make sure that they don't move. Um, I want to be able to apply the conformal coding technique to other stem cell types. And I also want to be able to evaluate the impact of these conformally coded neural stem cells on behavioral outcomes. Because if ideally we're decreasing the immune response, then we would hopefully have better behavioral outcomes as well. And I'm also looking into, as another side project, um, doing a nanoparticle synergy uh, for cytokine uh, trapping. Any questions? Yes. So the question is why use neurospheres versus neurostem cells? Um, and when you have a, the single cell neurostem cells being transplanted, you already have such low survival rates. When you have neurospheres, they form as like a little ecosystem. So it's an array of single cells that are clumped together that are supplementing each other with growth factors and different secretory proteins that make them more viable. So being able to transplant little environments that they create on their own is more beneficial than a single cell that is dependent on the environment to supply that for them. So you're kind of transplanting little ecosystems within themselves. Um, yes. Encapsulation may alter attachments of the cells to ECM and whether that's important because generally cells need to attach to ECM to complement survival for example. Yeah, so one of the really cool things about these cell, these cells is that they secrete those same pro, those like ECM um, proteins as well. So that's why we use the neurospheres. I think the capsules definitely will probably impact their ability to do that, which is why we want to be able to evaluate that um, during our studies. But that's it's something that we're interested in looking into. Um, so I noticed that there were a lot of like empty uh, droplets in your um, app, in your mixed in with the cells. Does that impact? You know, are you are you able to separate those from the cell encapsulated um, capsules? And does that impact if you can or cannot? Would it impact? You know, the final transplantation into the animal? Yeah. So thankfully, our our collaborator lab has been optimizing the techniques for conformal coding. And in like the past three months, we've been able to get rid of the empty capsules. So now we have a gradient that post conformal coding during our purification process, we have this gradient that removes all of the empty capsules. Um, I didn't show that in the images that I have, but when we post process, we remove at least, I think 90% of the empty capsules that are there. Yes. Um, good, great presentation. Um, my question is about um, your future direction here. What is the actual feasibility of making a nanoparticle for cytokine trapping? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I've actually been working on this as a side project. Um, and the idea with sequestering the secreted factors using nanoparticles comes from this, this little pocket here of the chart. 
And so I wanna be able to synergize the encapsulation with the nanoparticles. And so the idea that I have um, that was um, a collaboration with one of the grad students in our lab, Giancarlo, he developed these heparin nanoparticles. And so the idea was to take these heparin nanoparticles, combine them with the neural stem cells, encapsulate them, and then be able to have the trapping happening there, um, which goes to your question um, about the 70 kilodalton size of proteins being able to get in. And so we went through this nanoparticle uh, fabrication and characterization process where you start with just your polymer, you do some nanoprecipitation, and you get your PLGA core on the inside and the heparin on the outside. And to demonstrate that I was able to, to do this, I conjugated a FITC fluorophore using EDC NHS chemistry to have the fluorophore on the outside. Um, and some preliminary um, characterization of the nanoparticles um, demonstrates um, that we are able to conjugate the FITC on them and that it doesn't significantly affect their polydispersity, their size, or their charge. Um, and I was able to conformally coat uh, these nanoparticles inside of the, the capsules. Um, and as you can see here, the actual capsule structure um, is not significantly affected. You're still able to conformally coat the beads, even though the nanoparticle is in there. Um, and to demonstrate the fact that we can visualize them after that, you can see in the green that those are the FITC heparin uh, nanoparticles. So we've done some preliminary work to demonstrate that it is feasible. I have, I have another question. Yes. So you say that your com committee members um, recommended you to look at the bursting size, the mm -hmm. bursting um, rates in the inflammatory environment. What what are, what do you expect? Do you expect um, them to burst more in the inflammatory environment or less um, in an inflammatory environment? I hope that they burst less. I hope that based on the environment that they're in, they're more willing to stay inside of it. I think the rupture rate that we saw in the conditions where they have both, both growth factors in the media kind of leads them to want to like go towards those factors. Um, so I'm hoping that if they're in an inflammatory environment, they're not going to want to go towards that. So I'm hoping that they don't rupture as much, but that's data to come. Okay, great presentation again. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, James, uh, right here on the right. Cool stuff. Um, how do these particles in your neurospheres respond to lipids? So that's something that I have not looked into. I'm particularly new with the nanoparticle aspects of the project, so I don't know how they respond to lipids. Um, is that a reason I should further look into? Like, do you know if that's greatly affected? Well, like the injury side, well, like the brain. Right. And so, um, presumably, yeah, presumably the macrophages are ingesting that, and so every cell type there is probably exposed to those same lipids. And so, I'm wondering, even at the biochemistry level, if these capsules can survive. Oh, you mean the capsules, not the nanoparticles, or the capsules, the capsules, the capsules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's something that I I can definitely um, look into. It's not something that we've had as the, at the forefront, but that's something that I could definitely look into. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Degradation period, in other words, would you have a subpopulation that degrades um, within a week and a subpopulation degrades within two weeks and things of this nature? Yeah. One of the, one of the I, I, and the other question had to do with can things, one of the hypotheses is not so much, you know, what the cell is going to do in terms of integrating into the host. It's actually what the cell is releasing mm -hmm. that can affect, have good effects on uh, the surrounding environment, including toning down inflammation and things of this nature. So do things get out? Uh, things do get out of the capsules. Uh -huh. um, and that's why we wanted to show the permeability um, diffusion assay, because as much as the things are getting out, things are getting in. So we wanted to make sure that things didn't get in above 150, but proteins that are smaller than that, we could see diffusion in and out.
So things are able to get out. Um, and in terms of the degradation rates, we are able to tune that. That's just going to be affecting the, the capsule um, stability. So you can do that using different arms, uh, for example, peg malamide. For the injectable hydrogel that I use, I use a forearm peg, which have different degradation rates. You can also use different cross linkers that also affect the pore sizes, how fast it degrades. Um, so there's definitely a lot of um, biomaterial tuning that can go into that to get the results that are necessary. Um, but that's a lot of, um, it's not as easy as it's said. There's not. there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of engineering that goes into that. So it is possible. Um, it's just not something that. But you're a biomedical engineer, right? So you can do that. <laughs> I will be after this PhD. Okay. Um, the, uh, what was the thing? Uh, yeah, in, in the diabetes wor world, are they encapsulating single cells or uh, or uh, groups of cells? Um, no. So in the diabetes field, um, they're doing the pan the pancreatic islets. Right. And so they're groups of cells. So so you could do like in our uh, human um, studies that we're doing with uh, human Schwann cell transplantation, you could actually group uh, groups of, of, of cells, mm -hmm. adult cells, mm -hmm. and you can encapsulate them and we could actually utilize those in our transplantation studies. Yeah. It all depends on if you're able to like form them into the the spheres or group them together to be able to run them through the device. Oh, cool. Yeah, oh. there is a there is a limit on the um, parameters of it. Um, if the cluster sizes are too small or too big, we are limited by that. Um, right now, our ranges are the lower limit is 50 microns and the top limit for encapsulation is 200 for proper um, capsule formation. So that's also um, worth to take into account if you're looking to apply for, for example, the Swan cell transplants. Next up, thesis committee. Um, Dr. Jacqueline Sagan, Dr. Courtney Dumont. Uh, Jacqueline Sagan. She's right there. She's right there. Yeah, um, Dr. Brambilla and Dr. Alicia Tomei. Yeah. Great talk, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. You have any questions? Yeah, I'd just like to thank my lab um, and my committee members, as well as uh, the MAMI project and the DRI for all of their um, assistance and my mentor, of course. Thank you.